The Right Reverend Monsignor Ronald Knox is here this evening to talk about G.K. Chesterton, The Man and His Work. Monsignor Knox. My most cherished memory of the late Gilbert Chesterton was that of a luncheon party with friends in Hertfordshire, after which he was asked if he would walk down to the end of the garden so that a bedridden old lady upstairs might see from her window the great Mr. Chesterton. He acceded readily enough, though it was with more difficulty that we persuaded him to remove the waste paper basket with which he had modestly obscured his features. To relieve his self-consciousness, I suggested walking with him. Oh, do come, he said, then you'll look like the ordinary person. He was, it is to be remembered, not only a fat man and proud of it, but very tall and broad. And I honestly think it was this physical greatness which he had the intention of parading, set off by contrast with the ordinary person, myself. But as I walked down such a garden path as he would have loved to describe, flaming with poppies and delphiniums by the side of an old mill stream, I was vividly conscious that his intellectual greatness might have been set off not by such an ordinary person as myself, but by almost any figure in contemporary life. Almost anybody was an ordinary person compared with him. I call that man intellectually great who is an artist in thought. There have been artists in words who were content to borrow the thoughts of other men. There have been great thinkers who were content to express themselves anyhow. There are only a few whose thought seems to spring out of them clothed in words that adequately express it. Plato, for example, or Pascal. Chesterton was an artist in thought. He was an artist in the sense of one who drew pictures before he started writing. And most of us know how in his pictures a single figure full of movement stands out luminous from a vague background. So his mind saw things. It seized on the essences of them. When he writes about a primitive monster with a strangely small head set on a neck not only longer but larger than itself, with one disproportionate crest of hair running along that neck like a beard in the wrong place, with feet each like a solid horn alone amid the feet of so many cattle. It takes us aback at first until we realize that it is a perfectly accurate description of the horse. So he saw with a vision not given to many of us, that still stranger creature we call man. I call that man intellectually great who can work equally well in any medium. I believe it is true that Chesterton walked into the office of his literary agent one day and asked if there was any book the publishers wanted. Nothing in your line, I'm afraid. The last thing we heard of was a Saturday evening post wanting detective stories. Oh, well, I don't know, he said, and sitting down there and then, wrote the first of the Father Brown stories. Detective stories, extravaganzas, poetry, drama, history, biography, essays, controversy, all came alike to him as his medium. He was not a, a careful craftsman in any of them. Perhaps the Ballad of the White Horse was his most accurate piece of work. But always the luminous idea stood out, the idea we had never seen looking at the facts a thousand times because it was so simple. I call that man intellectually great who sees the whole of life as a coherent system, who can touch on any theme and illuminate it, and always in a way that is relating to the rest of his thought, so that you say nobody but he would have written that. Chesterton was such a man, the body of ideas which he labelled rather carelessly distributism, is a body of ideas which still lasts and I think will last, but it is not exactly a doctrine or a philosophy, it is simply Chesterton's reaction to life. His work burst upon the world with an astonishing maturity of observation and of thought. By the time he was thirty, when he had written The Napoleon of Notting Hill and his life of Dickens, 
He would say he had not merely seen through, but lived through everybody else's illusions. He wrote Heretics in 1905 as a man already tired of that tired aesthetic world in which he had grown up, as a man already too sophisticated for that sophisticated liberalism which was then invading our politics, as a man already too disillusioned to believe in the incredulities of the late Victorian scientists. And at this point, if I may pardon for a chest may be pardoned for a Chestertonian way of expressing myself, he grew up from manhood into boyhood. There was a boyish strain in him as one who has never quite got over reading Treasure Island. He owed much to Stevenson. RLS, we affectionately call him, just as we still talk affectionately of GKC. He borrowed from Stevenson, in spite of a wide difference of temperament, that aggressive optimism with which he proceeded from 1905 onwards to attack the winning side. He defended small nations at a time when we were being told to think imperially, defended private property when we were all playing with socialism, defended the small businessman and the small shop when everything was falling into the hands of the chain stores, defended the home when women were going feminist, defended marriage when society had made up its mind to accept divorce. And yet, while he stood for very old things, he always seemed much younger than the people he was arguing with. His whole pose in controversy was that of the enfant terrible who cannot be stopped telling the truth. His general philosophy in The Man Who Was Thursday and The Ball and the Cross, his theology in orthodoxy, his political views in What's Wrong with the World, they are all thrown at you with a boy's light-heartedness. The most boyish of his tricks was the little laugh he couldn't resist when one of his own impromptus amused him. You could hardly call it a chuckle or a giggle, more like a little neigh of excitement, high-pitched, impossible to reproduce. I can remember when I first heard it. It was at the meeting of an undergraduate society at Oxford, and the occasion of it was some controversy then in progress between two towns in Suffolk, as to which was the original of Dickens's Eatonswill. Delighted as he was that Dickens should be in the news, he couldn't resist pointing out, as always, the obvious truth which everybody misses. The ideal of the modern man, he suggested, and here his own laugh came, is to be able to say, I have built my bungalow on the exact site of Sodom and Gomorrah. But his whole manner in controversy was one, I do not know how else to describe it, of schoolboy impudence. He had the impish delight of the pupil who has found his master out in a mistake. Deeply as he cared for all that he stood for, an argument was always something of a game to him. I remember once when I was criticizing the theology of a peer of the realm, who for political reasons had decided not to use his title, I asked Chesterton whether he thought it would be unfair in writing about him to give him his full title nevertheless. And the laugh came again as he said, it's a foul weapon, but we'll use it. It was in the year 1922 when his age was still short of fifty, that Chesterton, if I may be allowed to pursue my paradox, grew up from boyhood into childhood by a change of religion. To be sure, there was always a childlike element in his character. I like the story of a small guest at the children's party in Beaconsfield who was asked when he got home whether Mr. Chesterton had been very clever. I don't know about clever, was the reply, but you should see him catch buns in his mouth. He did not, like many grown-ups who are reputedly fond of children, exploit the simplicity of childhood for his own amusement. He entered with tremendous gravity into the tremendous gravity of the child. It must be confessed, too, that like other great intellects, 
he went about somewhat in need of a nurse. It may not be a true story, but it certainly is not an incredible story that he once telegraphed to his wife, Am in Liverpool, where ought I to be? But I mean something different when I suggest that in the remaining years of his life, Chesterton reached the age of childhood. His thought was as vigorous as ever, and I am firmly of the opinion that posterity will regard the everlasting man as the best of his books. But his ideas seem to grow even larger and more luminous. Behind the tortuosities of his style, he detected a vast simplicity of treatment. He contributed once to a broadcast series under the title of Six Days Hard. Each speaker was to describe the events of a week or his own experiences during the week and choose his own method of approach. The rest of us talked about this and that. Chesterton devoted 20 minutes to the six days of creation. The reason for this change was a simple one. He had found his home. Just as the hero of his own book, Man Alive, walked round the world to find and to have the thrill of finding the house which belonged to him, so Chesterton probed all the avenues of thought and tasted all the philosophies to return at last for that institution which had been his spiritual home from the first, the church of his friend, Father Brown. He would, I think, have done so before if he had not been anxious to spare the feelings of his wife, a heroine of all his novels, who only followed him into the church four years later. Readers of his autobiography will remember how, in one of the earliest chapters, he describes the chief figure in a peep show which was the delight of his youth. A man who stood on a bridge carrying a golden key. They will remember how, later on in the book, he uses that figure for a symbol of one whom he came afterwards to recognize as key bearer and pontiff. He felt himself that he had come home. He was still a fighter, and in some of the causes he fought for he did not carry with him the sympathies of all his co-religionists. But those religious ideas, which were the deepest thing in him, no longer made him an outlaw in a world of madmen. He had found companions at last in the children of God's nursery. So, only a few years back, he went to Lycia to visit the shrine of that saint whose message to us all was to be converted and become as little children. He fell ill on his return, and a few days later we buried him in the new cemetery at Beaconsfield, the extension of that graveyard which covers the bones of Edmund Burke. A book which came out some time ago under the title of Premature Epitaphs summed up his characteristics in a tribute still applicable, though alas, no longer premature. Chesterton companion, his companions mourn. Chesterton crusader, leaves a cause forlorn. Chesterton the critic, pays no further heed. Chesterton the poet, lives while men shall read. Chesterton the dreamer, is by sleep beguiled, and there enters heaven Chesterton, the child.